That was quite a ride, if I do say so myself. Hello, everyone. So, Wrath of the Triple Goddess. In some ways, this book is exactly what I expected, but in so many others, it was not. I think I had more fun with this book than I did Chalice of the Gods. It doesn't have the existential theming of that book, but overall, I'd say it was a better experience. I loved what it did for our main trio, exploring their vulnerabilities and outlook on life. I loved the appropriately freaky elements, and I loved all the mystery reveals, some of which seriously caught me off guard. Also, it's kind of funny that this is Rick's first real Halloween special in this universe, this many books in. But it makes sense when you remember that the original series took place over the summer in four out of the five books, and almost every series and book since then has taken place over a shorter amount of time. But with all that said, we have to start somewhere. So Percy's had a mysteriously quiet few weeks after Chalice of the Gods ended, and when he's called back into the office, he finds out why. Hecate, the triple goddess, the goddess of night, crossroads, and magic, shows up saying that she has kept the other gods off of him because she has a very important task for him and his friends, taking care of her magic pets for a few days. All while she's on vacation, and if he fails at all, he'll die horribly. So, business as usual, I see. Hecate invites them to her home in Manhattan, which is actually really cool and really well fleshed out. The door has a statue of three beasts on the front that all say different things. The animal habitats are appropriately extravagant and suited to the intended magical beast. The whole house has a gothic feel, but in a cool way. And the place clearly has a lot of history behind it. For the trio, though, Hecate made some bathrooms, but since she doesn't understand mortal needs, they are misconstructed with things put in the wrong place, and not working as expected. There's a scene where Percy is forced to use his waterbending powers to give himself a proper shower. Things go smoothly for a while, but as expected, they eventually go awry. Grover gets tempted, and he ends up taking a strawberry-scented potion that turns him into a goat monster for a few minutes, and he destroys a whole bunch of the place, and, oh, releases two of Hecate's magic pets who are now roaming Manhattan. That's obviously bad, so the trio needs to start searching. Now, before I move on to the plot, I'd like to address a few other aspects of the book that I really enjoyed, starting with how the humor was handled. For the most part, it's great. Percy is just as sassy as ever, and just as willing to describe the insanity and misery of his life. There are also tons of jokes that made me laugh out loud. I've read all the other books in this universe, and some of my favorite jokes and funny chapter titles are in this book. Though there was one small problem I had with the humor, and that's how referential it was to past books. It's happened before in this series, but it felt a bit more common in this book, and sometimes it took me out of the moment. Though it did lead to this one moment where Percy remembered a Half-Blood Christmas, which made me feel super validated for going out of my way to read all the companion books and side stories in my last major video. Oddly enough, one of the aspects of the book that stood out to me was how well it handled mystery, specifically revealing early on that something is wrong with Hecate's place, even before the heroes show up. The book plants seeds that slowly paint a picture of what happened to it, and by the end, that picture is crystal clear. It even unveils a shocking secret of a character that we thought we knew, showing an unexplored part of their past that seriously makes you think about what could have been. And that's as far as I can go without getting into spoiler territory. The next section will be spoiler light, so skip to the conclusion if that's going to be a problem, but I am going to spoil major plot points towards the end of the book, so proceed at your own risk. Okay, so both of Hecate's pets that escaped used to be human, but after suffering a tragedy, they each struck a deal with the goddess of night to become her magic pets forever. In a way, an act of love, since it took them away from their source of pain, but they're still kinda stuck. In their efforts to get the pets back, Percy sees and understands their pain, and he empathizes with them, and he promises to try and make things better for them, even attempting to bargain with Hecate in the process. I love this. It's a very Percy thing to do. He remains just as selfless as he's ever been, and of course, it works. It also turns the runaway pets from basic MacGuffins to sympathetic characters that now help our heroes with their remaining tasks. I also noticed a running theme across many of the important characters in this book, being the different ways people respond to pain, be it physical or psychological. From Sally's memory of Hecate's house, to Grover's guilt over destroying the house, to Eudora from hiding a secret from Percy, to Gail and Hecuba's pasts that led them to being stuck as Hecate's pets, and their dissatisfaction with their current situations. 
and they all respond to this in different ways. There's a scene where we find out that Chiron has been in pain this whole time from a poison arrow wound courtesy of Hercules. But because he's immortal, the pain will never get better. But what keeps him going is helping the young heroes under his care. That's a great bit of characterization for a character that we thought we knew. And it's not the only time we get that in this book. But not everyone responds to pain in a healthy way. And when that happens, they need help. So they get the pets back and the heroes realize what's wrong with Hecate's house. And fixing it can't be done with just another battle. So after the week is up, Percy has got to do yet another very Percy thing, and try to convince another god to change things for the better, risking his own annihilation in order to do so. And of course, to the surprise of no one who's read for this long, he succeeds, opening up another opportunity for those who need it. All in a day's work. I've said it before, I'll say it again. Rick has improved as a writer over the years, and it shows. There are some issues, like when Clovis shows up, Rick continues the trend of confusing Hypnos and Morpheus, and the slight overuse of references to previous books, but those are just nitpicks. This is one of my favorite Ryardenverse books, and while I haven't decided where it lands on my personal ranking, it's absolutely going to be an A or S tier. Despite its smaller scale, it's just as impactful because of how intimate its story is. And despite my continued worry that comes with adding more and more books to this universe, even I've got to admit, Rick has still got it. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you all next time.